Hi everyone, I'm Clark with CK Med, and this episode is powered by Med School Tutors, your resource for one-on-one -on -one online tutoring for the USMLEs, shelf exam, and even the residency application process. Our tutoring incorporates custom study schedules, content mastery, and even test-taking strategies that you're not really gonna get anywhere else. And I know this because I used to be a student with MST before I even tutored here. For a free phone consult, use the link in the description below, Mention that you heard about MST from CK Med on YouTube and use this discount code CKMedPlus for your special pricing. I hope you enjoy the video. Hello everyone and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark and I'll be taking you through GI tract infections today. This PowerPoint has been adapted by Nikki Shaw um, and I've updated it and added in some important information, some mnemonics, and hopefully a little bit of fun. So let's go ahead and get started. So before we start talking about infections, it's important to understand the basic uh, aspects and functions of the gastrointestinal system. So the function comes down to uh, what do we do with the GI system? And that comes down to the digestion, absorption of nutrients. Uh, it also is a protective barrier. Um, it has protective measures to keep uh, the microbials away from infecting the whole rest of our body. Remember, this uh, is a, a system, in order for us to get nutrients, we have to eat food. And we know, and our body has figured out, that uh, when we take in food, such as uh, eating a, a cheeseburger or maybe in, uh, ingesting an apple or something, we always know that there's microbes surrounding and covering that material. And so we need to have that proper defense on the inside of our bodies as we're digesting this material. So factors, um, that uh, play in part uh, of uh, separating the different types of flora that we find in our body uh, come down to external factors such as your diet, geography, uh, even your age. Uh, and then if you use antibiotics, as we know when we uh, use broad spectrum antibiotics, it increases uh, the possibility of infections such as uh, C, uh, C. difficilis, which we'll be coming into later. Uh, we also have internal factors like the temperature. So we have different organisms and different aspects of our gut, such as up in our mouth compared to maybe our colon. We have different temperatures. So that's going to kind of uh, manipulate the different type of organisms that we're going to find there. Acid secretion as well. So not many things live in our stomach and that keeps away certain organisms which is great for us um, but we also have mucus production the movement uh, of our bowel and the food that we ingest moves uh, microbes out of the way in addition we have like IgA so we also have bacterial factors so some bacteria like to fight over the nutrients or attachment sites so we have our normal flora versus maybe our pathogenic uh, organisms that come in and that's an important aspect of keeping away uh, pathogens uh, is that normal flora we also have defense mechanisms such as our gastric acid like I mentioned we also have IgA Lactoferrin, uh, it's something we have all um, most of our mucosal surfaces, including our respiratory tract, which I covered in the respiratory module. Um, and uh, so those are kind of all the aspects of our GI system that help uh, organize and shape our own specific uh, like microbiome within us. So if we're starting it off, we're going to start uh, obviously on the top. So if we were to incorporate uh, infections or uh, microbes within our mouth, we're going to be talking more about your streps. Uh, for example, we talked about endocarditis uh, in our cardio section, and that was hooked to uh, our strep viridens group, such as uh, strep mitis or strep mutans. These are all part of our viridens group found within our mouth. So dental procedures can lead to them making their way into the blood, and if you have an already exposed or damaged valve, they can kind of grow on there, and that can lead to endocarditis. However, once we pass the mouth, get out of the pharynx and not dealing with respiratory system, we get into the esophagus. And there's three infections that really uh, uh, occur here. And they uh, usually occur having to do with HIV or immunosuppression. Um, so one in particular is candidiasis. And how we separate this from the other two is what we find is we have linear plaques. Uh, and when we scrape these off and we look under it under a microscope, we can see pseudohyphae, we can see the yeast, and then we can see those germ tubes. So these are aspects that you're going to find with candidiasis. Um, another thing uh, specific is when you see pseudohyphae plus yeast, and you see germ tubes, that's going to be specific for candida albicans. Um, and so uh, definitely be, be looking for all three of those for candida albicans specifically. Um, 
as far as how Candida infects, we know that uh, once our CD4 count gets below 500, we can have Candida infections in our mouth. However, this doesn't affect our esophagus until we get to a CD4 count less than 100. When you do your multiple uh, multi-systems, uh, you're going to learn about HIV and how it affects all the different systems, and this will come back. But remember candidiasis, and they really like uh, asking you the difference in CD4 count once uh, you uh, see this infecting the esophagus, and that's less than 100. Um, another infection is CMV. This is cytomegalovirus. This is herpes uh, HHV5. Um, and uh, this uh, will lead to one or maybe just a few large flat oval or diamond shaped ulcers and has those satellite ulcers. Um, you also see owl's eyes inclusions when you do um, uh, micro, uh, microscopy of, of one of these ulcers and you can see that uh, cytopathic effect. Um, with uh, the, the next infection, we have HSV1, which is another uh, herpes virus. This is actually herpes uh, HHV1, also known as HSV1. Um, this one's going to have multiple, multiple small uh, raised edges. That's the key feature with this guy. Uh, they're kind of like volcanoes, so little, little miniature volcanoes. Uh, when you look in there, you're going to also see those syncytia and multinucleated cells. This is your margination, multinucleation, and um, your... Uh, migrate or uh, molding of your cells. So these are your three M's. So molding, margination, and uh, multinucleation. Those are the three M's that you find with herpes viruses. All right, so now down out of the esophagus, we can have infective uh, gastritis. And one of the things we're going to be thinking of for this guy is H. pylori, obviously. So this is a gram-negative curved spiral rod. It's motile. Uh, it is catalase positive and urease positive and oxidase, os oxidase positive. This is your triple banger. So please keep this in mind because this is one of the only organisms that has all three of these present. Um, pathogenesis, pretty much, it has urease. And so when it gets down into the stomach, it breaks up urea into uh, ammonia, and ammonia is basic, so it kind of protects itself from the acidic environment. Uh, this can also be damaging to the mucosa, um, and it can erode away, leading to ulcers, and that's one of our presentations with, with this guy. It produces an exotoxis, a va uh, exotoxin, which is a VAC-A. It can damage cells, a protease, lipase, and mucinase. Um, these guys also damage and, and increase the, the damage uh, to the mucosa there. Um, you also have a type 4 pili system. Uh, it's an ejection system allowing for attachment. That's why when you guys uh, look up to these guys, they're attached to the surface. Um, and I just think of this as more like a harpoon or a grapple system. It has them uh, hooking into the, the cells there. Also has two other earth, um, toxins, including that VAC-A, which we talked about. And it just uh, promotes cell growth and inhibition of apoptosis. And remember that this is something H. pylori is one of uh, the leading causes for a gastric cancer. And so that's how it does that, is it uses these toxins. So when H. pylori is present, you have low acid, you're thinking more of the lines of progressing to gastric cancer. If H. pylori is there and you have high acid, so insult plus insult, you're going to get more of that peptic ulcer disease. So how we diagnose, we can do serology. Uh, we can also do the carbon urea breath test. This is super specific, but it's also really expensive. And then we also have uh, fecal antigen. This is usually something only for treatment, as we can see the breakup products of this H. pylori. So now on to diarrhea. This is uh, the infamous diarrhea, and so I just want to talk about the basics of diarrhea before we get into the organisms. So there's acute, uh, and this is acute, persistent, and chronic. These are pretty much based on their time frame. So less than two weeks is acute, two to four is persistent, and chronic, which is uh, four weeks long. Um, usually when you're talking about your chronics, you're talking about your pathologies more than you are talking about uh, your organisms. So pretty much we're going to be talking about acute and persistent diarrhea here. And then when, within each of these, we can talk about how are they acute or how are they persistent. And that is the type of diarrhea we have. So we have non-inflammatory diarrhea. And this is uh, going to be your watery, uh, not bloody diarrhea. You might have a slight fever, um, but most likely not. Uh, and it usually involves the small intestines. However, this is not always the case. We also have inflammatory, which uh, most likely is going to be your bloody or watery that progresses to bloody. You're going to see a fever for sure because it's inflammatory. You know, when you have inflammation, you're going to be secreting cytokines. Uh, PGE2 is going to go up to your uh, hypothalamus. 
uh, especially uh, your posterior aspect of your hypothalamus, and that's going to be stimulating your fever that you're going to have. Um, and usually this is occurring in your large intestines, but remember there are quite a bit of exceptions. Um, so let's go ahead and get into our non-inflammatories. Um, and this is going to be things that you get in your foodborne infections, uh, usually longer in incubation, uh, and uh, it's, the incubation is usually longer than even the lasting of the symptoms, uh, because it usually takes a while for these guys to colonize and cause any sort of diarrhea to occur. So let's go ahead and start these off. So we're, we're going to be starting off with some E. coli. This is one of the most common causes of diarrhea, and we have to associate and organize all these E. coli. There's a lot. Um, and so one of the first ones we're going to come up to is enterotoxogenic E. coli, or ETEC, also known as traveler's diarrhea. So each of our E. coli's, I'm going to have an associated letter for them. So this is toxogenic, so ETEC, and so this is traveler's diarrhea. So all these uh, associated for each of these are going to have their own associated letter. So trying to keep everything organized. So pretty much you get it from food and water. Um, this is somewhere you can go travel to India or you know Bangladesh or Vietnam or Asia or anywhere technically, and you can get ETAC. This is pretty much your common food poisoning you're going to get from eating street vendors' foods or some restaurant where the people didn't handle or wash their hands properly. Um, uh, so what this guy does is it, it invades the small intestines. Uh, as we talked about, this is one of our non-inflammatories. It colonizes and attaches by uh, what is known as your CFA. Um, then once it attaches, it doesn't enter the cell or uh, cause death of the cell. However, it produces enterotoxins, and this is two enterotoxins, your LT and your ST. Uh, what these guys do is they cause uh, chloride secretory diarrhea, and how exactly they do this is your LT will stimulate your GS subunit, keeping it on, and that will upregulate your adenylate cyclase. Uh, we also have your ST, um, which is going to go straight to your guanylate cyclase, um, and these are uh, the, the two enterotoxins that this guy produces. Both of these stimulate production of a cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP associatively, and those will stimulate the CFTR chloride channel, which will stimulate its secretion of chloride, water will follow, and sodium will also follow out into the lumen, so this is going to be known as a secretory diarrhea. Um, uh, what happens as far as how these toxins enter the cell, we have, uh, these are your AB toxins, and the B portion of this toxin binds your GM1 receptor. Uh, B is for binding, and then A is allowed to enter and stimulate these adenylate and guanylate uh, cyclase associated. Uh, we also have... Um, uh, treatment for this guy is obviously you're just going to be losing a lot of water, so we want to rehydrate our patients. So diagnosis of E. coli, this is our basics. I'm not going to repeat this every time unless there's something special about it that differentiates it from uh, any of the other guys. But this is uh, E. coli is gram negative. Uh, it is one of the ones you should be definitely thinking of when it's lactose fermenting. This grows pink on McConkie's auger. Uh, it is motile, so E. coli are all motile, um, and in order to diagnose ETEC specifically, ETEC specifically, not any of the other guys, you take mice adrenals and you um, actually throw out a bunch of their cells and lay it onto sort of like an auger, and uh, what happens is you take uh, this organism and you streak it across, and because it produces this LT toxin, it can stimulate uh, cyclic AMP production within these mice adrenals. That will stimulate the production of uh, the adrenal hormones and secretion of them. And so we can actually pick that up. If it's been secreted, we know we have something that is causing that secretion, and that's going to be uh, these LT toxins. Okay, so let's go on to our next E. coli. This is EPEC. So this is enteropathogenic E. coli, so EPEC, and this is your pediatric infantile diarrhea. So uh, don't mind that thing up in the right corner. I'll be explaining that in just a few seconds. So uh, the way you, where you get this is usually developing countries. Uh, it's very dangerous because it usually occurs in children. So we know diarrhea is not a great thing, uh, and it's even hard on us as adults, but imagine it as an infant. That's why it has such a high mortality. So when we ingest this, it colonizes in the small intestines like our non-inflammatory diarrheas. However, this is, it has no production of toxin. So there's no production of toxin. Uh, however, what it does is it has this enteric adherence factor, EAF, bundle forming pillus, BFP, and allows it to stick to our microvilli, just as you can see on uh, this guy up here in this picture. 
So you can see our little E. coli is binding and sticking to this. And what are they doing? Well, this is the easiest way to remember it. And I'm going to revert, uh, refer you back to Dr. Pettis, which uh, was our behavioral sciences uh, professor that taught us some of the classical and operant conditioning. And he always refer to this stupid pigeon that kept pecking at this little lever and the corn would drop down and, you know, it was learning that it was getting a reward as it was pecking at this thing. So, you know, peck, peck, corn, peck, peck, corn, peck, peck, corn. So epec, peck, pecks at the microvilli. So it's exactly what it does. So this epec actually pecks at these microvilli until it effaces them. So it erodes uh, and effaces the microvilli. This leads to osmotic imbalance, uh, osmotic watery diarrhea, and this is something that is like and can be found in rotavirus and C. perfringens. C. perfringens has a little bit different mechanism, and I'll explain that uh, once we get there, but rotavirus actually has the same thing. It effaces the microvilli specifically. So treatment, obviously, rehydration, um, and diagnosis uh, is going to be that same thing. However, here, remember, this is osmotic diarrhea. This is not secretory diarrhea like we had in ETEC. So that's a differentiating factor be between these two. And they want to know that mechanism. So effacement of that microvilli is super, super high yield, okay? So now on to the big bad boy, Vibrio cholera. So this is a, a single or double S-shaped curve gram-negative rod. And what do I mean by that? Take this picture right up here in the top right. This guy is a perfect example. There's two of them hooked together end to end, and they form what is known as this S shape. It looks like a little S. Um, they're gram negative and uh, the serotypes O1 and O139 are the ones that are going to be causing the disease of Vibrio cholera. There are other serotypes of this that do not cause this severe form of this. So keep that in mind. You're going to be looking for that O1, O139 uh, seropositive or antibodies against that in order to diagnose this. Uh, mot uh, these guys are motile, so they have that H antigen. So remember that H is for flahagella. And so that's how I remember that guy. Um, they're oxidase positive. Uh, these guys are acid labile and halo tolerant. So um, these guys are actually going to su survive in salt water. So it's not going to be something that will keep them away. Acid labile, however, this comes into the process of ingestion. So we have to actually take in a lot of these guys if you have an empty stomach in order for them to make them make their way through the stomach into the intestines to cause the disease. Either that or we can take in a smaller amount and consume it with a large meal. So just imagine you're walking into the clinic and you see someone that has this giant bowl of stool over here and you're like, hmm, I really want to take a spoonful of that and try it with my steak. So this, um, you're going to actually have, a, have to have a large, uh, as, uh, a large uh, steak in order to buffer uh, the acid uh, secretion in your stomach so that these guys don't die and they can make it to the intestines and cause you to have the disease as well. So that's uh, kind of how this acid labile uh, is bypassed uh, when we have a large amount of the bacteria that we consume or we take it with a large meal. Um, so these guys, once they make it into their intestines, they produce the cholera toxin. So they bind uh, and adhere to the intestines and then secrete the cholera toxin. So this is an AB toxin, uh, same way it works by binding your GM1, the A portion enters. And this guy is very similar to ETEC. So uh, it stimulates your GS subunit, which increases cyclic AMP, which cyclic AMP stimulates your CFTR to secrete chloride. Once uh, chloride is secreted, uh, which is known as secretory diarrhea, uh, water is going to follow this, sodium is going to follow this, um, and that can lead to hyponatremia, which would, can cause seizures uh, and confusion. We also have potassium. Why? Because we're kicking in our RAS um, system. And so at this point, what we're doing is uh, aldosterone is increasing secretion uh, of our um, or absorption of our sodium in addition to uh, secretion of our potassium. So that's going to lead to hypokalemia, um, which when we have hypokalemia can lead to metabolic acidosis. So that's something you're going to be looking for. In addition, we are losing bicarb. So secretory diarrhea, we can spit out all our bicarb, which right here, which is in addition going to be causing our metabolic acidosis. We have two things leading to metabolic acidosis. Um, vomiting and diarrhea can, uh, can be one of our associated symptoms. So as far as the diarrhea, this is one that you're going to be wanting to look for in a description. This is known as rice water stool, and that's exactly what is in this picture up here in the corner. Um, you, that means pretty much you have about 20 to 30 liters of day of this mucusy, chunky, um, uh, chunky mucus, but watery uh, stool. 
uh, severe diarrhea like like a ton and um, these flakes that are floating have bacteria colonies floating in them so definitely don't take a spoonful of that that's uh, not good so um, we also have uh, the diagnosis of them this is very high yield um, because this is a differentiating factor between all the other vibrios so uh, how we diagnose this is we'd grow it on tcbs auger uh, we could also look at the rice water stool that helps us diagnose this and look on it in a micro microscopy but how do we confirm diagnosis we take out our tcbs auger the way i remember this is taking care of business with rice water stool so as you're dumping away um, and taking care of business of that rice water stool you know you use tcbs to grow vibrio cholera um, so once you take that stool sample, uh, you do the oxidase test with it, um, and then this one is the differentiating factor for this O1 or O139 serotypes, is this is sucrose fermentation positive. Okay, all our other vibrios, even the vibrio cholera, which are not O1 and O139, are going to be sucrose negative. So we're going to come up to those a little bit later. Treatment, fluids, and ion replacement. Uh, we also have that vax cora serotype O1. Um, vaccine that we can give to, to people in endemic areas. All right, next organism. This is going to be Clostridium perfringens. Uh, so I did re I refer to them a little bit earlier. So um, pretty much uh, I, I would be referring just to your type A, which is the one you're going to find in the USA. Uh, you can get this from turkey, chicken, beef, and beef stew, and gravy. Gravy, gravy, gravy. Mm -mm -mm. So this is a gram-positive anaerobe. Let me repeat that again. This is a gram-positive anaerobe. It's a very large rod differentiating uh, between our bacillus group, which is a very large rod. We, the only thing that can help us differentiate between them is this anaerobe. Bacillus is aerobe. This is anaerobe. So be looking out for that guy, okay? They both are large rods like these right here. Um, uh, they're both spore formers, so that's not going to help. Um, they both cause diarrhea, and they both cause food poisoning. So how do we differentiate it? Well, maybe the exposure a little bit, but at the same time, aerobe versus anaerobe, okay? That's how you differentiate these guys, bacillus and clostridium. So pretty much you ingest it and it colonizes the small intestine. Uh, it sporulates here. So it forms spores in this environment, then releases its C. perfringens enterotoxin. This is heat labile. Uh, and how this works, actually, um, because we're talking about clostridium perfringens, uh, this actually forms pores in your microvilli. So it perforates your microvilli. Perfringens perforates the microvilli. So perf, perf. Okay, so that's the way that we can remember this guy. And remember, when we perforate our microvilli, we're de uh, destroying uh, the barrier in between blood and lumen. Uh, therefore, at this, well, I mean, it's not actually blood, but like uh, the barrier of cellular, our enterocytes, right? And uh, so what happens, we just leak out all our electrolytes and water, and this is going to cause an osmotic diarrhea. So we talked about that in EPEC, uh, so keep that in mind, and then we're going to be talking about that in rotavirus when we get there. So incubation for this guy, is going to be 8 to 24 hours. It's really, really fast. Um, watery diarrhea, you can have severe abdominal pain, um, but remember, uh, because this is non-inflammatory, you're not going to have a fever. So diagnosis, we got to look for the spores, and we got to look for a whole bunch of them. Um, or we can just straight up look for the enterotoxin present in the feces. All right, so let's talk about that one that we just were referring to. So this is a Bacillus cirrus. This is a large gram-positive rod, um, again, similar to Clostridium. Uh, one other characteristic feature is that they kind of line up along in these little chains, so look for that. That's also uh, one of the features that this guy has, but this is the one you're looking for, aerobe. This is aerobe, uh, it's spore former as well. So where are you going to get it? Meat. So if they had meat and they had you have this picture or just they said large rods, you want to look for that aerobe or anaerobe. Uh, you can also get in vegetables, salads, sauces, and pasta. I'm going to be circling this one. This is kind of important. And some desserts. But pasta is one of the ones they like giving, also vegetables and salads. So incubation is 8 to 16 hours. This is actually faster than C. perfringens, but you can still have that overlapping time, so you can't really differentiate it based on time. Uh, ingestion, it colonizes small intestines and productions of LT enterotoxins. Uh, what this guy does is it goes in, stimulates your GS subunit, like some of our LT toxins of ETEC and Vibrio cholera, and that increases adenylate cyclist and causes secretory watery diarrhea. Um, and so 
uh, this uh, organism actually also produces an ST neurotoxin, but that comes to play when we get to our food poisonings. So our LT enterotoxin is for diarrhea, and our ST neurotoxin is for our like emetic uh, neurotoxin, and that's going to be in food poisoning. That's going to be within a uh, you know two to three hours that you're going to start experiencing that, and that has to do with rice. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So now on to rotavirus. I've referred to this twice, so let's talk about this guy. Uh, so this is a 11 segmented double stranded RNA virus. Um, so this is one of the only virus uh, is within your group three viruses. Uh, it is naked with three capsules, uh, capsids, so it's group three. And guess what? It's got three capsids. So that's how I organize rotavirus to group three. That's in that real virus family. Um, and we have multiple serotypes. Uh, this usually occurs in children, um, and we call it winter gastro or summer gastro, depending on when it's endemic. Um, and pretty much what happens is um, we can get it from unsafe water, adequate, inadequate sanitation. So places you're going to get this uh, as far as children. Where do you think children go to get illnesses? Of course, daycare. So daycare or child care or something like that, uh, grade school, early grade school, this is going to be something where you're going to have diarrhea and a lot of children, and this is the guy you want to think of. So incubation is actually pretty fast within a couple days, small intestines, and what this guy does is it shortens and blunts the microvilli. Where have you seen that? Well, E. Peck, Peck corn. So E. Peck is uh, the guy that also does this. So symptoms, it's just really sudden onset, really watery diarrhea, and vomiting. Um, so you're going to be, uh, you know, just imagine a boat stuck in like a muddy shore. And so you turn on the motor and it's spraying up mud out the back end. At the same time, uh, you know, someone's vomiting over the front of the boat. And so it's going to be, uh, you know, spraying poopy diarrhea mud everywhere from the front and from the back. And so vomiting and diarrhea in the back. So that's going to be uh, your rotavirus. Why did I say why am I referring to a boat? Well, because you got a rotor, right? And the rotor is the one that's kicking up the diary in the back and someone's for, uh, vomiting on the front, okay? And you also have severe de dehydration, like Vibrio cholera. So if someone has um, severe diarrhea, severe de dehydration, but it was like a child that was in daycare, I'm gonna be thinking of rotavirus. If I have someone that has severe diarrhea and um, severe dehydration and watery diarrhea, Right? and they just traveled to Vietnam or Asia or India or something like that, I'm going to be thinking Vibrio cholera instead. Okay, uh, That's kind of, you want to base it on your uh, um, uh, epidemiology. So diagnosis, we can do latex agglutination. This is one of the things we can do for uh, quite a few viruses, and this is the one that we can do it with. Um, it used to have a vaccine, but it caused intussusception. Um, so we stopped that. Now we have a live attenuated vaccine. It's approved, but we don't use it routinely. Okay, so if someone says, oh, I'm up to date on my vaccinations, it doesn't mean that they had rotavirus. So don't rule that out um, unless you can from the rest of the step. All right, norovirus. So this is another guy. Uh, this is a, uh, one of your Khaleesi viruses, positive single sense RNA virus. It's naked, and so that's going to be in your group four viruses. Um, this is usually occurring in older children or adults, having to do with you know cruise ships, um, or old, old folks' homes, hospitals, those sorts of things. That's where uh, these guys are coming into play. Um, so this is usually occurring around winter, but can, because uh, not many people go on cruise ships in winter, but they can be in uh, summer as well. So uh, pretty much you can get it from uh, an infected food handler, not handling stuff properly. You can also get it from raw shellfish, shellfish, shellfish. So how do we differentiate this from the other shellfish um, infections that we have? So uh, what are the other shellfish? So some of the other ones are like really, really fast, like our toxins from our shellfish or shellfish toxins. We'll get to those a little bit later. Um, these are super fast within one or two days of ingestion. Okay, that's going to be something that's super, super fast. I mean, with almost within uh, like an hour uh, or within hours. If it's a couple weeks, then it's something uh, having to do with more of a viral replication. And that's going to be, um, I'm sorry, uh, within one or two days, uh, um, it's going to be this norovirus. So one or two days, this. Uh, if it's when a couple hours, that's a shell fixed toxin. And if it's a couple weeks or more, then you're thinking more of your hepatitis A. But that will have different presentation. 
Okay, so pathogenesis for this uh, multiplication in, in the uh, small intestines. It spares the large intestine. It's only in small intestine. Um, I don't know if that was super high important, uh, important but uh, it just shows that there's no fecal leukocytes. That might be something you can find on lab exam or lab uh, reports uh, in the stem, and that might help you diagnose Norwalk virus over the other guys. So symptoms, you know, one to two days, and uh, abdominal cramps, myalgias. Myalgias come along with a lot of your bacterial infections, uh, also some parasites, but and, and invasive bacteria. However, um, these guys. Uh, would be associated with bloody diarrhea, and this has watery diarrhea. So mo for mo most viruses, we can diagnose with uh, RT-QPCR. Uh, we can also look for the virus in the stool, but usually the RT-PCR is what we use. All right, so Cryptosporidium parvum and hominis. Uh, this is persistent diarrhea, so now we're getting into some of our persistent diarrheas. Um, and it's usually uh, occurring in children or immunocompromised. It's super common in children. And uh, it's usually actually one of the most common and is the most common protozoal di uh, diarrhea diseases in children uh, in swimming pools. Okay, so associate those together. So if you have a question that's like, oh, what is the most common uh, di cause of persistent diarrhea in children? You're thinking of Cryptosporidium parvum. If they were more specific about protozoa, you're still thinking Cryptosporidium. If they're thinking uh, that you get from swimming pools, you're still thinking Cryptosporidium parvum. Okay, that is persistent diarrhea in children. Uh, it's waterborne. You get it from all these uh, these guys. And pretty much what happens is you ingest the thick-walled oocysts, which are these guys here, um, and that is your infective stage. It fertilizes zygotes, and it forms two structures. Uh, one, which is a thin-walled oocyst, and this guy can reinfect the human, and that's why it would be persistent. Or it can make sporulated ones that you can poop out. And guess what? We can find those on our stool, uh, ONP, which is these guys here. And that can reinfect another person. Okay? Uh, usually it's like 2 to 10 days incubation and it lasts for a couple weeks after that point. Stomach cramps, dehydration, watery diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. But this guy, because it's persistent and reinfecting, you can have fever with it. So this is one of your non-inflammatories, but yet it has fever. Um, you're, you can diagnose this with Zeal Nelson, which is your acid fasting, which you find up here in the top right. Immunofluorescence, which is actually the best one for this. Um, this I'm not sure if this is immunofluorescence, but uh, this is the one that we use to diagnose it. We can also use antigen detection and OAP on stool. Uh, keep in mind these pictures. They're not going to use the same pictures they gave you in lecture. So look at your pictures in lecture and go, okay, that I am familiar with this, but also Google other pictures, right? This was actually on our exam with were these pictures, and I, you can look at that and go, what the heck is that? Um, unless you had seen it before. Um, so this is uh, actually high yield to get used to different types of imaging that we see some of these guys, or like uh, microscopy and stuff. All right, Giardia intestinalis. So this is another one of our uh, persistent diarrheas. Uh, this is a flagellated protozoa, which you can see uh, down here. Is, you know, our little flagella on this little kite little guy with a little mustache that I drew on there. And he says, may we? Uh, this is a, a binucleated pear-shaped. And you can see, obviously, the pear shape of this guy. And uh, transmission for this is going to be your waterborne, uh, foodborne. You can get it from camping, uh, like going in the mountains or near lakes. Uh, you can also get it worldwide, like Asia is a high prevalence, Ex example like Nepal or Bangladesh or Vietnam. Um, usually this uh, Giardia intestinalis is actually found within beavers, so North America is one of the uh, largest places that you're going to find beavers, also uh, in places like Russia and, and Northern Asia. Uh, you can have a presentation of beavers, however it's not always in beavers, and so you can kind of get it anywhere. So look for the symptoms and signs of this. So um, it's usually the most di uh, diagnosed enteric parasite. It's very common uh, in U.S. and Canada. And it has abrupt onset. One or two weeks after uh, they had the possible exposure, they're going to have foul-smelling stool, greasy steatorrhea. It starts as watery diarrhea, however, but then can progress to greasy steatorrhea. So keep that in mind. You'll have abdominal cramps, um, and you'll also have severe flatulence. However, this isn't always a presentation. So look for images. If they 
present an image, make sure you know how to diagnose these. Uh, for the really common ones, like uh, Giardia intestinalis, especially here, look for crappy pictures on Google, like ones that don't even look like Giardia. Uh, make sure it is Giardia, obviously, and not some other parasite. But once you make sure that it is, now you know what the crappy pictures, because they could give you something like this up in the top right. Does that look like Giardia? Not at all. So um, that actually is Giardia there. And he's got little miniature, uh, multiple of these miniature eyes in here. And he's got a big nose in this one. Uh, maybe a little nose in this one, I don't know, um, but that is uh, Giardia. How we diagnose this? Um, well, pathogenesis first off, you know, small intestines, you'll have cysts and trophozoites, but we can do uh, ELISA, we can do stool examination, we can see um, the, the diagnostic stage, which is your cyst or trophozoites uh, within that stool. So that's uh, how we can diagnose that. So Cyclospora chiatinensis, uh, so this is something you can find in Wisconsin, Georgia, New York, Texas, but also mostly in tropical areas. Um, so Mexico is also another place you can find this guy. So this is something that's common in, uh, you know, on vegetables and stuff like that. She gave you the example of cilantro. So uh, I just think of for chiatin, chiatinensis, right? It's got some cayenne pepper on it. So I'm thinking cilantro and cayenne peppers. So think spicy Mexican food with cayenne, right? So chiatinensis, you're going to get from that cilantro in Mexico, uh, but also other things, vegetables and such. So this is non-inflammatory diarrhea, uh, na uh, nausea, abdominal pain, uh, usually abrupt onset after a few days uh, of exposure. So this guy, uh, it insists in the small intestines and it uh, penetrates sporozoites and then oocysts eventually develop and are released in the stool and we can actually find them. So we can do a Zill Nelson stain, so this is acid fast. And how would we differentiate this guy from this guy? So these guys are really small and pink and they don't have really dark black dots that we find when we do our Zill Nelson. There's a lot of them. Here is very light like pink uh, or eosinophilic almost like color. I know it's not eosin, so we can't see eosinophilic, uh, but we also have these dark things and usually they're very singular. There's not a lot of them uh, present. And that's gonna be your Cyclosporia chiatinensis. Okay, look up definitely other pictures of this guy, but uh, most of them actually look like this. So we can look for um, the unsporulated oocyst in the stool, which is that guy in the picture, but the infected phage is uh, sporulated. All right, cyclo, uh, Cycloisospora belli, or belly, as I refer to it. This is uh, something you find in South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Um, and so this is where you can also, if you're in the U.S., can get it in very few places, like daycare centers, uh, immunosuppressed patients, um, as well as psychiatric institutions. Um, it's very unlikely you can get this unless you have a picture associated with this. And so how I uh, identify this is, wow, look at that that oval-shaped egg with that giant belly. So this is actually Cycloisospora belly. So look at that big old belly. Sometimes there's even, he's so bellyicious that he's got two of them. Look at that, he's got two big bellies. And so this is your Cycloisospora belly. Um, ingestion of the oocysts, uh, you form sporozoites in the small intestine, fertilization, and that spits out more unsporulated oocysts, and that's what we look for here. Eventually they get sporulated and we got two of them with this guy and that's something also we can find uh, in the stool as well. Um, so pretty much uh, how we diagnose this, we can do wet mounts to look for them, but also these guys actually autofluoresce. This which is actually uh, pretty cool to, to see these guys autofluoresce. So now on to the inflammatory diarrheas. All right, so the first uh, inflammatory diarrhea that we have uh, is going to be one of our E. coli's. This is enteroinvasive E. coli, so E-I-E-C, um, and we're going to be use, utilizing this I to emphasize some of the aspects and characteristics of this organism. So usually we get this in Southeast Asia or South America, uh, where it's endemic. Uh, pretty much you ingest it, and this causes invasion of your large intestine, and once it gets in there, it induces intake, also known as endocytosis. Once it gets into the cell, it lives within there and it pops open that phagosome and it lives within the cytoplasm. So this is intracellular replication in the cytoplasm. And what happens is uh, it can go from cell to cell uh, uh, via some spreading uh, uh, f through like desmosomes and such through that. There's no specific uh, as far as details you need to know for that, but it just can go from host cell um, to host cell. Uh, however, what happens is we have this intracellular bacteria 
and our cells express uh, some of the proteins out on its MHC1 molecules, and our immune system picks up on this, so our CD8 T cells. And so our CD8 positive T cells respond to this, kill the cell, and uh, this is causing a sloughing off and bleeding of our mucosal uh, in our intestines, which leads to the inflammatory response um, and leads to the bloody diarrhea that we have. Uh, this is very similar to shigellosis, which we'll be talking to, uh, about next. However, this is not because it produces a shigatoxin. There's no shigatoxin in this guy. It's just simply because we're inside the cell and our immune system responds to it and kills off the cell. And that's going to lead to that bloody diarrhea. Um, and so how we differentiate E. coli from shigella uh, will actually be describing on the next slide. But this, uh, the E. coli, remember, are motile. Shige shigella are non-motile. And then treatment is rehydration. So what is this Shigella? So uh, Shigella species has multiple within there, um, and we'll be describing each of these right now. So these guys are acid stable, so they can make their way through the stomach no problem. Um, and so we only need a, a couple of them to enter into the body and we can get Shigellosis. Uh, they're non-motile. This is one of the key features of these guys, the gram-negative rods that are non-motile. Okay, so there's uh, three that you should know, and this is your Shigella dysenteriae, Shigella flexneri, and Shigella soniae. So Shigella dysenteriae is the one that produces this neurotoxin uh, and this shigatoxin. Uh, so the neurotoxin can lead to a coma, but the shigatoxin is the one that causes the problem of bloody diarrhea. So this guy, what it does is shigatoxin enters into the cell, finds our ribosomes, and specifically, and you need to know this, you need to absolutely know this, the 28S rRNA of your 60S subunit is how this shigatoxin works. And when it binds here, it blocks protein synthesis. And they can ask you either one of these, either this specific here, or what is it stopping that's protein synthesis. This will kill the cell, leading it to slough off, and guess what? You get bloody diarrhea because of this. It also leads to vomiting, fever, because it's inflammatory response, um, and severe abdominal pain. Why? Because we're destroying some of our intestinal mucosa. We also have this other guy, Shigella flexneri, has very similar symptoms to, to this guy in presentation. However, uh, the exposure for this guy is going to be your homosexual men. And so I just remember your flexing men, right? So flexneri for your homosexual males. Um, and then uh, as far as this guy, this is the only Shigella that produces hydrogen sulfide gas, so H2S production. All the other guys are negative on that, but this one is positive, And that is a characteristic shared with salmonella, and we'll be getting to that in a little bit, okay? So Shigella sonii is the last one to be talking about. This is something you're gonna find in children. And so this is a uh, little sunny boo-boo, right? So Shigella sunny boo-boo. Um, this is gonna be finding in little boo-boo, which is less than five years old and uh, appearing in daycare. So this is watery, abdominal pain, possible bloody and vomiting, um, and uh, that's gonna be in children in daycare. So how you differentiate, you're like, oh my gosh, I have all these things occurring in daycares, my rotavirus, right? Um, my Even my EPEC in little children or something like, what, what, what am I doing? How do I differentiate these two? You will have more information in the stem giving you about the organism, okay? First off, daycares, non-inflammatory, that's not Shigella. Shigella will have inflammatory, you're gonna have abdominal pain, vomiting, you're gonna have inflammatory diarrhea. It is watery, but you will have inflammation. So that is one differentiating feature just on presentation. However, uh, for this guy, they're probably gonna give you, oh, we have a gram negative rod. Okay, that's definitely tell me we don't have rotavirus. That's a virus, it's not a gram negative rod. So that will put me in the more realm of what is in daycares that is gram negative rod, and they say it's non motile. That is non motile. I have Shigella sonia. This is very nice. Helps me separate it, bring it right down to those guys. So virulence factors, we have that endotoxin because it's gram negative, LPS. Um, exotoxin, uh, this guy can inhibit sugar and amino acid absorption. Neurotoxin, as I spoke, uh, causes coma. And then this guy actually has this really uh, feature. It was not tested for me, uh, but it can be tested for you, absolutely. This is NAD glycohydrolase. Uh, this is high yield for boards, um, so expect it maybe to come up on your exam. Um, and what this guy is, it destroys NAD, and when we don't have NAD, guess what? Well, just think of the symptoms of NAD depletion in our body. Right? NAD depletion uh, or deficiency leads to pellagra. And those are the four Ds, right? 
Uh, you have dermatitis, you have dementia, you have diarrhea or the dumps. All right, that's the other D. Um, and then lastly, you have death. And guess what? If we do it on a cellular level, it's going to lead to cell death. And that's when you get rid of your NAD. So um, pretty much you uh, in, ingest it and it attaches. And these guys specifically go to the M cells of your pyre patches and sometimes can spread to your large intestine. Uh, this uh, actually induces uh, plasma induced endocytosis so uh, it uh, causes the cell to uh, suck it up it pops the phagozyme and now it lives within our cells it can go uh, from host cell to host cell and this how it goes between those host cells is actin filaments we're not exactly sure as far as um, our EI e e EC um, in the last case, uh, if it uses actin filaments uh, between cell to cell, but we know that uh, this guy does. Uh, it also can cause cell apoptosis, um, which would release IL-1, and that's a type 3 secretory system. Um, that's not super high yield, but uh, just to keep that in mind for this guy. So Shigella, how do we separate these? So if we were to grow uh, this person's diarrhea on some McConkie auger, which uh, is diff or selective for gram negatives, uh, and differential on uh, lactose fermentation, these guys would not ferment lactose. So they would have pale colonies, right? If they ferment lactose, they're gonna be pink. Um, if they don't, they're gonna be pale. Uh, they're immotile, uh, they, I remember like I mentioned earlier, there's no gas production from glucose. So how do, what is this test? We take a tube, we have this um, like kind of gel auger with glucose found within it. We take some of the organism on this little spear, we smear around on there. Uh, get it all nice and chunked up with some bacterial colonies, and then we stab it into the gel so it can go all the way down to the bottom of the gel. If this guy fermented glucose, it would produce CO2. CO2 gas would be produced, and because it's not liquid, it's actually a, a solid media, it would actually cause it to break open into pieces. So it would take some of that auger would break in half and push it up into the tube higher, and you have this space of gas in between. Just uh, just imagine like uh, putting gas, uh, actually I have no analogy for this. So uh, H2S production also specifically in S flexneri. Okay, keep that in mind. All right, salmonella, this is the other comparison point that we have here. So uh, these guys, salmonella, are a species of gram uh, negative motile rods. Uh, they are motile, you know why? Because salmon swim. These guys cause gastroenteritis and the most likely cause of just basic gastroenteritis is your S or salmonella enteritidis nice because it's in its name. Um, it's abrupt onset, usually uh, two to five days long, and this is something you're thinking of, uh, of salmonella poisoning when you're getting it from chicken or poultry or, you know, if you're Rocky Balboa and you're ingesting a whole glass of raw eggs, you can get it from eggs or vine, uh, vine fruits or cucumbers. So that's going to be uh, that type of salmonella poison. We also have septicemia. That's low on the chain of high yield. Uh, enteric typhoid fever we're going to be discussing on the next slide, so uh, don't uh, don't mind that guy. Then we have a reptile associated. Um, this is actually more of your uh, S. enteritidis that you can get from this. Um, this is something you're going to find with turtles that are less than four size as to why they are banned in the United States. Um, we also have snakes, frogs, and lizards you can get this from. So ask what their pet is. Do you have a snake? Do you have a lizard, right? If that comes up in the stem, be thinking of salmonella. If you see a turtle, if you see a snake, if you see a frog, if you see a lizard, some sort of reptile, be thinking of salmonella, okay? Ingestion. So this attaches to the small intestine. It invades your pyres patches, which is similar as we were just describing in Shigella. Both of them invade your pyres patches. Uh, it replicates within the vacuole. It doesn't pop the vacuole. It actually replicates in the vacuole. Um, and then it can transport across the cytoplasm and go into the blood, especially if we're talking about enteric or typhoid fever with uh, salmonella typhi. So diagnosis, it's McConkie's auger, which is gram negative, obviously. Uh, this does not ferment lactose, and so it's non-lactose fermenting. Uh, and then this is one that can produce H2S. And how do we do that? So we grow it on TSI auger. Uh, most Shigellas do not produce H2S, but remember that Sony, uh, uh, Shigella flexneri is the one that can ferment uh, and produce H2S. Uh, 
Um, there's also gas production of glucose here. That was not in Shigella. Those were non-gas production. Uh, however, uh, these guys do produce a glass, a, a gas with glucose, so that's going to break up that auger. Uh, definitely just look at pictures if you don't understand what that means, and it will totally make sense. And the H2S uh, production on TSI auger is actually pretty cool. It turns it black. It's like this yellow auger that just turns absolutely black, um, and that's with your hydrogen sulfide. Remember, these guys are motel. All right, specifically one of them is super high yield and understanding the time frame is also important. So hopefully you were paying attention uh, when they discussed um, the uh, typhoid Mary story. Uh, if you weren't there for that or didn't listen or uh, were studying something else, uh, definitely just go on YouTube, check out what is, uh, t who is typhoid Mary. This is an interesting story and helps you hook Salmonella typhi pathogenesis to how this lady presented and how she infected lots of people. So the location that you usually get this is uh, Asia, Mexico, and India, India, India. This is one of the high yield points uh, that you should know for, for finding this guy. Uh, this was actually was uh, the location where we got our STEM information on our test from. So you ingest it, and the first week, uh, it makes its way to the pyres patches, uh, like we talked about Salmonella do, and it invades uh, through your ileum and makes its way into the bloodstream uh, after that first week. So from week one, uh, so day seven to day 14 or around, uh, this guy is, has made it out of the intestines into the blood. So if we were to collect some of this patient's blood, they're not feeling well, um, we can have a positive blood culture on this. This is at the same time, it's floating around in the blood, making its way, I don't know, maybe around the skin. And so when it's around the skin, it can cause a rose-colored lace pattern rash on the trunk. It could be like lightly uh, rosy pink or purple colored. Um, so that's something to look up, and that's during uh, like your week two. Okay, um, and that's when you have your positive blood culture. So what happens after it's flowing around the blood, you have your macrophages and your monocytes. Those pick up all these guys and go, what the heck is this? And it gets transported to the liver and the spleen and the bone marrow. So this is a problem. Why? Because now it's bringing these bacteria to the liver, it's bringing it to the spleen, and it's bringing it to the bone marrow. And these are now three replication and sites where salmonella can infect. So in the bone marrow, it causes cell death and leads to possible anemias and leukopenias, which you're going to see in the symptoms presentation. Also, once it makes its way to the spleen, uh, usually it gets cleared up there. Actually, this is one of the places where uh, our immune system works very well and removes salmonella. So if you have, a, uh, for some reason, patients that lose their spleen, like is autosplenectomy in sickle cell patients, or patients that have uh, hereditary spherocytosis, and we need to remove their spleen so they stop having anemia, these patients um, actually are going to be more susceptible to salmonella. And uh, these patients most likely are going to also invo involve bone in infections too. So you can have um, like... Uh, osteonecrosis and, and osteomyelitis because of asplenic patients. Uh, the other thing with this liver is once we make it in the liver, we can make it into the bile. When we make it in the bile, we make it to the gallbladder. And this is a place where it can colonize in the gallbladder and live and hang out and spit out little bacteria over years and years and years and known as the carrier status. This is very important. You know why? Because this was typhoid Mary. She was a cook she made lots of food for people, and they all got ill. And they thought she was like a witch or something like that, so they locked her up in jail. But eventually she broke out of jail and started working at other homes and getting more people sick. So eventually they locked her up in a hospital for the rest of her life for like, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years or something like that. Um, and so that was uh, typhoid Mary. So what happens once we spit out this bacteria, it goes back into the intestines, as we know, through uh, our biliary tree, out of our ampullary vader, and out through our... Um, uh, into uh, the lumen of our duodenum. So it makes its way through the intestines, and this is now week three. So week three is reinfecting of the intestines, uh, and <clears throat> that is when it's going to finally make its way into the ileum during this week three. And now at this point, we've had an immune response for three weeks. And we know that acute inflammation is neutrophils and macrophages. However, this has now been three weeks. So we've sensitized T cells and B cells. And so what happens is when these guys re-enter into the ileum, 
right? Because they're just bacteria and they're like, hey, what are these ileal cells? I'll enter in here. Once it finds uh, the ileal cells and tries to re-enter, our T cells respond with the, sort of like a hypersensitivity and it call, causes granulomas or ulceration um, of the ileum. And these guys actually lead to ulceration. And the ulcerations for these guys are actually going to be parallel, oval shaped, and I don't know why I type parallel twice, um, and uh, these will be kind of along the lines of your lumen. So if I draw, here's the lumen of your intestines. This is going to be your ulcers for um, your salmonella typhi. We also have another thing that causes ulcerations in your ileum. However, these ulcers actually line away this way. And so they're kind of transverse. And the way I remember this is transverse for T, B. Okay, so tuberculosis is the other one that's differential for ulceration. Remember, they're aligned in different ways. So transverse for TB, and then you'll never forget that salmonella is the opposite, and that's going to be linear and parallel to the lumen. Um, what happens here is once we have the ulceration, we can actually perforate, and this is bad. I actually saw this in India this summer, um, and uh, we got to kind of bubble this out. Uh, of the intestines through the little ulceration that was made and it smells really bad and it looks like mustard. So uh, definitely uh, you don't want to get infected with these and be taking care of this. How do we remove the carrier status? Remove the gallbladder. So symptoms, we talked about that anemia because the bone marrow infection, leukopenia as well, macular uh, rose colored lace pattern rash on the trunk that's during week two. And remember uh, these guys are non-fermentation of lactose, they are H2 production, gas from glucose, and motile. We also have typhoid vaccines, so uh, if you're planning on going anywhere that has this endemic, get that vaccine. All right, Campylobacter. So onto these guys. I know uh, Salmonella was kind of heavy, but let's jump over to uh, the little bit easier guys. So Campylobacter has these really cool looking, uh, almost spirally shaped uh, gram-negative rods. Um, they're motile, and they have uh, these little um, um, flagella at the end right here and they kind of come off on the end and uh, like that guy. So these guys are actually thermophilic. So this is one of the key features for Campylobacter is that they're thermophilic. They like to grow in 42 degrees Celsius, where our normal body is 37 degrees. It will grow in 37, but it likes 42. They're catalase and oxidase positive. The most common one you're gonna come across is that uh, Campylobacter jujeni. So it's gonna be obviously something that is gonna be infecting your jejunum. Not necessarily. It affects most of your small intestines um, and your large intestines. So it's not specifically jejunum. We just happen to find it and isolate it from uh, some actually uh, sheep and, and chicken and other uh, animals from their jejunum. So that's why we called it that. So it occurs in summer months, uh, usually in normal aged patients, uh, adult patients. And this is the number one foodborne illness. Someone ate unpasteurized or drank unpasteurized milk, ate some chicken, you know, poultry, uh, turkey, right? Um, sheep or, uh, uh, or anything like that. That's where you're going to get your Campylobacter. Also, you can get it from your sick cats and dogs. So if they're... Uh, pet was recently ill, be thinking of Campylobacter. So it invades your small intestine and your large intestine. This is super high yield. I don't know why, but um, it invades both. Um, it's enterotoxin. Uh, it causes watery diarrhea at first, but it also produces cytotoxin, which is virotoxin, similar to the sugar toxin, which causes, again, bloody diarrhea as to why it's in this group. Um, it usually occurs several days after ingestion. It's not right away. Um, you can have severe abdominal pain and that type of diarrhea we just discussed and the fever. But uh, this is more of the high yield that you're going to get with, with these guys is what are the complications with this? So complications with Campylobacter are your Guillain-Barre in about 40% of the cases. Actually, a lot of our cases have Guillain-Barre. And I saw one of these patients in India as well. Um, I actually got to watch her over the two weeks that I was there go from being unable to walk or move her legs with very, very low reflexes or small reflexes um, to actually being able to walk. Uh, which was just amazing to see to see that happen. We also have reactive arthritis. Uh, this is uh, worse with patients that have HLA B27. Remember that is associated with your ankylosing spondylolitis. So reactive arthritis hooked up with infections is going to be more prone in patients that have HLA B27 present. These are catalase oxidase tests we can do, and these guys do not ferment any sugar. All right, Yersinia yeti enterocolitica. Why do I say Yeti? Well, it's not just because I have a Yeti picture on there for no apparent reason. 
I will explain that in just a second. So etiology is usually in children, but it can also be in adults. It's a gram-negative rod. Um, how you get it is usually from dogs, like little puppies. Hey, we just got a new puppy this week, and now our kid is sick. Why? It could be because of Yersinia. You get it from their fecal matter or contaminated milk associated with these guys, or um, just any of, uh, you can get it from cows as well in their cow's milk. So pretty much what this guy is, it invades the distal ileum, and uh, it makes its way into the lymph. And once it invades into the lymph, uh, which remember your ileum, a distal ileum is near your appendix, okay, keep this in mind, invades the lymph nodes in that general region, uh, releases an ST endotoxin, which increases cyclic GMP, and this can cause um, a secretory diarrhea similar to ETEC. But also, uh, it can cause damage um, to uh, the mucosal just by uh, erosion and invasion of our cells. Okay, once it invades, our immune system can respond. It can kill and slough off the androcytes, and that can lead to bloody diarrhea as well. But the watery diarrhea is because it produces an ST toxin like ETEC, and that increases cyclic GMP. G, GMP. Okay, please remember this is cyclic GMP, not AMP. Symptoms of this, because it invades the lymph nodes, it may mimic appendicitis. This is known as pseudo-appendicitis. So this patient has severe abdominal pain and it seems just like appendicitis. But then you're going, wait a second, why am I being tested on appendicitis in a micro class? But that's because they're probably getting at Yersinia for you. So keep that in mind. This is a differential for appendicitis-like presentation. Um, and you're going to see that swelling of those lymph nodes in surgery. And this is one of the features that differentiates it from just basic appendicitis, right? You see normal big swollen appendix, not really lymph node involvement. I'm thinking appendicitis. You see lymph nodes involved and the appendix is totally fine. Now I'm thinking some sort of infection. And this is one of the key guys that does that. This guy is also associated with post-infective reactive arthritis, similar to we have with Campylobacter, so keep in mind HLA B27, that's a high board uh, exam question. So uh, how do we uh, diagnose this guy? And this is why I have this picture of um, the, the Yeti guy from uh, Rudolph the Rudin, uh, uh, Red Nose Reindeer. So McConkey's auger, when we grow it on there, it makes pinpoint colonies, very small. So Yersinia is, that, uh, is, is very small. It also has uh, specialized Yersinia you grow it on, but that's super low yield. However, how this guy grows gives it its name for this guy. So this is uh, your psychotroph. So it actually likes to grow in cold temperatures. We can grow it in warm and hot temperatures even, but this guy likes cold. So it is able to grow in cold, like even refrigerators or below that, negative one degree Celsius. And so that's why I call it Yersinia Yeti. Why? Because your uh, Yetis live in the snow. And so it's a psychotrope. So Yersinia Yeti, and remember that's your psychotrope. That is so high yield, it's going to show up in your stem and it's going to get you a free point. So don't miss that. All right, Vibrio parahemolyticus uh, and vulnificus. So these are your other Vibrio groups. Um, these are invasive, and so um, this uh, can actually cause bloody diarrhea, unlike our Vibrio cholera. Remember that just secreted our uh, enterotoxins, which led to secretory diarrhea with no invasion. These guys actually invade. So Vibrio parahemolyticus, um, these guys do not have your O1 antibody. Remember that is your Vibrio cholera. Um, and that's a, uh, the special type that we had uh, before. So how do we get this? We get this from uh, raw and poorly cooked seafood or oysters in the United States. Uh, it causes invasion and watery and bloody diarrhea and even vomiting. Remember, we still grow, grow our vibrios on our taking care of business uh, auger. However, these guys are sucrose negative. Negative. Okay, Vibrio color 01 and 0139 are positive for sucrose fermentation. These guys are negative. Um, you're most likely going to get Vibrio cholera, and you're going to see that positive, and then that's going to be your diagnosis, but they still could ask this. Now, the one key feature and why this is emphasized in different color is that you need to know complications. You have to be careful with this one. This is actually a high yield testable point. You get this from raw cooked seaweed and oysters. You can also have saltwater abrasions. When you have those abrasions from uh, Vibrio vulnificus, um, then you can also get fluid filled blisters to the skin. However, when you have this, liver disease patients are vulnerable. So, vulnificus, vulnerable liver disease patients. You got to look out for that. That is super high yield, okay? 
All right, now on to our next E. coli. This is enteroaggregative E. coli. This is super low yield, but just so you know, uh, let's put some A's into this. So there's absent invasion, and you adhere to the intestinal mucosa. And how do you adhere? You use your aggregative adherence factor, AAF. And this uh, allows it to then produce uh, its thick biofilm and attach and stay within there. It's sort of difficult for us to uh, eliminate this guy. It's usually just uh, our immune system that gets rid of it. So it also produces a cytotoxin. So it adheres, but it produces a cytotoxin, which assassinates enterocytes. And that can cause the watery and bloody diarrhea as to why this is part of this inflammatory and bloody diarrhea section. All right. Now on to the most important E. coli. If you get anything um, out of E. coli from bloody diarrhea, it should be this guy, okay? For the watery diarrhea, it's ETEC or EPEC if it's referring to osmotic diarrhea, but EHEC uh, is, is the one for bloody diarrhea, okay? So this is enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Uh, it's its old name. And now we refer to it as verotoxin E. coli or VTEC in the UK and shigatoxin um, E. coli or s -tech in the United States. So all of these have uh, them in uh, our different names. As far as pathology and pathophysiology uh, goes, when you get to the classes, you will see E. heck. Uh, but shigatoxin E. coli might be an option you might see on your micro exam. So remember that these are all the three names. So what happens? We ingest this guy and we get it from steaks, <coughs> shigatoxin S <coughs> steaks, and hamburgers, <coughs> E. heck. Hamburgers, uh, or from ingesting food after contact with animals. Like, hey, I just pet some donkeys and some uh, horses and stuff at the zoo and decided to not wash my hands and eat a hamburger. Uh, also at country fairs and stuff like that. This is where you uh, get exposure to this. So these guys uh, attach EAF and BFP. And we've talked about those guys before. Uh, this is a vero uh, It produces your virotoxins, or VT1 and VT2, which are your AB toxins. Uh, and this is similar to your shiga toxin. Why? Because it's specific to that same mechanism that we had um, before. So this is uh, your blocking of your 23S of your 60S subunit of your ribosome. And what does that do? Stops protein synthesis. Do not forget that. That is very high yield for your shiga toxins. Okay. Uh, also, the toxin can uh, make its way into circulation, make its way to the gomerulus, and damage uh, uh, it, leading to a portion of what is uh, our complications. We'll get to that in just a second. So diagnosis, again, McConkie's. You have your pink colonies because it lactose ferments. Uh, it's also motile. However, for this E. coli, this separates it from all the other E. coli. So do you think this is going to be a test question? I think it is. So this is a special type of McConkie's auger. They might just say, how would we differentiate someone that has bloody diarrhea after they ate a steak or hamburger thing that is also having renal involvement? So I have my diagnosis of EHEC and HUS following, which is uh, this guy down here. Okay. Um, how do we differentiate this from the other E. coli? Answer is using a specialized McConkie's auger. That's how basic your answers could be. <laughs> That's all I could say. You'd be like, uh, looking at all these other things, uh, H2S production, all these things, right? Remember, those are for other organisms. However, if they want to be really specific, they'll describe it as sorbitol McConkie's auger. Why? Because s -tech does not ferment sorbitol and that is your 0157 serotype um, this uh, out of this whole slide this uh, and hus are the most important things you're going to find on here okay sorbitol mcconkey's no fermentation of sorbitol definitely know that elisa dna probe whatever uh, hemorrhagic colitis uh, so that is the bloody diarrhea that you get that's adults elderly even children um, and that's going to have watery diarrhea with abdominal pain that then progresses to bloody diarrhea uh, following that, you can have complication involvement of the kidneys, is just hemolytic uremic syndrome, and your blood, which causes thrombocytopenia, uh, which then causes the RBCs passing all these clots that we formed, and then they shear, and that leads to schistocytes, and that can lead to hemolytic anemia. And then, uh, obviously, as we talked about, damage to uh, your kidneys, 
And so what are you going to see? You're going to see jaundice. You're going to increase bleeding time because we have thrombocytopenia and increased creatinine and BUN. Why? Because we're damaging the kidneys, causing renal failure. Um, and so this is very common that you're going to find in children after they have uh, EHEC infections. Okay, it usually uh, occurs uh, within a few days of presentation of bloody diarrhea. So the other presentation is if we add uh, some fever into this presentation and neurological involvement, that's going to then give it a, us diagnosis of TTP. So if you see neuro, TTP, no neuro, then you're thinking of HUS. There, I mean, there's a small amount of neuro in HUS, but like severe neuro, uh, it's going to be your TTP. So how uh, do they like asking questions? They're, so they'll give you the exposure. Maybe they're at a state fair eating hamburgers or something like that. So you can get your diagnosis. You're like, great. But that's not the question they ask. Um, so what they do is uh, we actually had a, a trick question on this guy, and it caught a lot of people. Um, but uh, you can you still are able to think through it. It's not too hard to, to go through. But we have a presentation of you know a 60 year old man just had some hamburgers. He's got bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain. Uh, initially it was watery, and now he's starting to bleed um, or have bloody urine and having we increased BUN and creatinine. Right, so we have some lab values of him. He says, "Oh well, my grandson is starting to present with similar symptoms." Uh, as far as what I initially had. And he's referring to the bloody diarrhea. And it says, what could uh, his grandson have? Or like, what could, what could be uh, an outcome of what his grandson would have? Like a complication, right? And they threw in hemorrhagic colitis, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and a, couple of, uh, a few other things. They didn't say TTP, right? However, you have to read that question very carefully. Because yes, the child is going to have hemorrhagic colitis, most likely. Right? So that could be a correct answer. However, the question wasn't asking what do they have currently because the child was having bloody diarrhea. They have hemorrhagic colitis already. It said what could they have after this or what is a complication of this? And that is going to be your HUS. Okay, You have to be very careful on what these uh, questions are asking. And they like to trick you with these guys, so look out for that. Okay? All right, Ballantinium coli. So Ballantinium coli, um, this is something you get in Latin America, Southeast Asia, or Papua New Guinea <coughs> pig. And where do you get it from? You get it from pigs. Oh, what do you know? That's so weird. Um, and so, uh, I, I know, a guinea pig. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, this guy I remember because uh, not just from the movie Sing with this pig in a, a ballerina uh, outfit. Uh, so this is Bala. Tintidium, so ballerina tintidium coli, um, and that has cilia. So this is your only ciliated protozoal infection, the only ciliated protozoal infection. So you see a picture like this guy right here, and you see cilia on him, right? He's got to see this hair. This is the tutu, okay? It's not just hair. It's not just cilia. It's actually a tutu um, of this guy. Why? Because we're talking about ballerinas, right? So here's the ballerina. And we get it from pigs. So the pig, that's a ballerina, ballantidium. He's got his tutu, like ballerinas have. Therefore, it has cilia. Hook all those things together, and you got this guy pretty pretty taken care of. Um, he also has this little belly thing in here. You can see it, this guy, this organ here. And uh, I think it's one of its storage vesicles. You can actually see that up in this uh, guy right here, too. Okay, um, so pretty much you ingest the, the cyst of these, which is uh, this picture up in the top right here. Um, it insists in the small intestines, and the trophozoites then uh, develop, and they colonize and make their ways to the large intestine, and they insist in the colon wall. So in order to actually visualize the trophozoites, which is this guy, the cilia, um, we actually have to scrape it off the wall. So that's something we need to look for. Uh, the problems with this is it causes severe abdominal pain and fulminant colitis. So when we do an endoscopy, we see tons of necrosis, just like eats away at everything. Ulceration can come from this. And remember, these are your ciliated trophozoites, okay? we got to scrape them off to get to them. And that is your balantidium coli. So then we have Entamoeba histolytica. 
And so this is uh, your pseudopod forming protozoa, right? Pseudopod uh, is outstretchment of the membrane. It's like this big gooey thing I reach out, grab on, and then drag myself to it. It's like how children, uh, you know, how they crawl. You know, they reach out their arms out in front of them and they pull themselves on their arm forward. Then they reach their arms out, grab on the ground, and then pull themselves forward. This is exactly how pseudopods work for this guy. Um, it has the, the pseudopods in the protozoa, but it's also perfectly round cysts. In both of these cases, what you want to look for is the all-seeing eye. Do you guys see this little eye right here? See him? It looks like a little eye. Oh, there's another one right here. Oh, and we got him here in these guys. That all-seeing eye tells you you have entamoeba histolytica. Okay, look out for that guy, and you have that. Okay, if you don't see those eyes, you don't have entamoeba histolytica. Think of something else. They might throw in an egg that looks, or a cyst or something, that looks just like this guy up in the top that doesn't have the eye, right? Be looking for Giardia because that might be the picture they used for us. It was absolutely horrible. It was round, um, but it didn't have the eye, so it's like, I don't think it's Entamoeba histolytica, and that was an answer choice, um, but I'm pretty sure it was Giardia, and the symptoms weren't even presenting like Giardia. So be careful with your pictures. Always be careful with your pictures on these guys, okay? Um, so endemic in countries like Central South America, uh, Africa, Indian continent as well, uh, often in homosexual men. Uh, so what these guys do uh, is that insist in, uh, and cause flask-shaped ulceration of your intestines, and that's because of the trophozoa it's invading. Um, and so you have your like your mucosa, you have your submucosa, and then your muscularis um, layers. And so this causes ulceration that comes uh, into the mucosa and submucosa. And it looks like, like, sort of like that. That's your flash-shaped ulceration. You'll see that most likely in PATH, um, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So d disease that this causes is uh, amoebic dysentery, as you probably have heard, or uh, intestinal amoebiasis, which is watery diarrhea or bloody diarrhea. Uh, other side additional things that you're going to be looking for, and this is uh, pretty much uh, a thing that's going to give it away, is liver abscess. So uh, you see a huge liver abscess. Uh, he's got bloody diarrhea. He probably has entamoeba histolytica. Okay, diagnosis of PCR serology, antigen testing, and then obviously looking for these guys in stool. All right, on to food poisoning. So uh, the first uh, guy we're going to be discussing is Staphylococcus aureus. This is gram positive, catalase positive, coagulase positive, aerobic, beta hemolytic um, organism. Uh, how you get this guy as far as food poisoning, you're going to have poor handling of foods, uh, cooked meat, bakery foods. This is going to be your cream filled or dairy produce. Um, also in mayonnaise that's been left out too long, fruits, vegetables, salads, anything that's not handled very well. And this is often in summertime. Summertime is a key feature here. Or Christmas time when people are not taking care of their food as they're serving their party um, over at their house for Christmas and enjoying, uh, you know, the eggnog and stuff like that. So uh, virulence, it produces an ST enterotoxin, uh, which does not do what our other ST enterotoxins have done with any of our organisms. This is special, and you have to know this. Uh, this is free points. It stimulates vagus and sympathetics and induces severe emesis. Vomiting within a few hours. Okay, you got a party, you got people, a bunch of people getting sick from this. They vomit really, really fast, right? And maybe they give you, oh, we had uh, Staph aureus growing. How did the toxin work? Vegas sympathetics at the same time. So parasympathetics and sympathetics stimulating. Uh, that's going to cause emesis. Um, and we would refer to that ST enterotoxin also as a neurological toxin. Uh, remember, um, we can also have some diarrhea that's produced, and this is going to be your enteric toxin. There's two of these. So ST enterotoxin is your emesis, uh, also known as the neurological. It also produces an enteric toxin, which is a different guy, and that produces diarrhea. Usually lasts uh, about one to two days, very short duration. How we grow this guy? Well, it's gram positive, so we're not losing McConkies anymore. That would kill this guy. And, our purpose of even trying to smear it on there. Um, and we'd grow it on mannitol salt auger for staff, uh, specifically, Baird Parker specifically for staff, and it's actually very selective for staph aureus. And then we can confirm via coagulase test. So we pretty much take some uh, plasma from blood, we stick in this bacteria. If it has a coagulase, it's going to coagulate and create a lump 
uh, of coagulation within this uh, flask of uh, plasma we have. All right, Bacillus cereus. So this is food poisoning and not uh, the infection that we had earlier. So it's a gram positive, remember, large uh, rod uh, arranged in chains. It's aerobic and it forms spores. So what happens is uh, these guys are going to be found more in your contaminated rices and pulses. So this is your Chinese restaurant syndrome. Uh, it's going to form spores in there and produce a preformed toxin. And then the person eats the rice after they reheat it back in the microwave like that's going to do anything. And they ingest this preformed toxin. And it is an ST neurotoxin or a medic peptide toxin. Peptide, peptide toxin. This occurs within a few hours, 6 to 24 hours, and bleh, vomiting. Okay, diagnosis, uh, blood auger. And we can grow uh, this guy on. Uh, we obviously can't take it because it's an ST neurotoxin, but we just take some of the spores uh, that were found in the, the contaminated food. We can throw it on blood auger with polymyxin to kind of separate Bacillus cereus from all the other guys that can cause this. All right, Clostridium botulinum. Uh, so this is actually a bonus guy. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys had discovered this, but you need to know this for board. So I'm going to go over this really, really fast. Okay. This is a gram positive, right? Clostridium is gram positive. It is anaerobe, right? Clostridium is anaerobe. And it is a spore former. So clostridiums and bacillus are your spore formers. Those are the only two that form spores. They're both gram positive. Differentiate on aerobic for bacillus and anaerobic for clostridium. Okay, so this botulinum, I'm sure you've heard about botulinum neurotoxin, type A, B, and E. Um, this is something you're going to see, uh, they're preformed, and it's in home canned foods, such as applesauce, fruits, vegetables, um, and uh, even in honey. And so uh, pathogenesis is we uh, bring in this guy, it's uh, the toxin, it's absorbed in the intestine, circulates in the blood, and it makes its way to the cranial and peripheral nerves. Um, and it can uh, arise within a day. Uh, and can be actually fatal within a day if we have too much of this. So you're going to have bilateral descending paralysis, descending paralysis, descending, descending paralysis. Okay. The only thing that's other is descending paralysis, but it's actually not too much of on the paralysis aspect, and it's not a sudden onset. Is myasthenia gravis? This is usually uh, a little bit slower onset, so that's something that can differentiate. Plus, they probably wouldn't have exposure of eating, uh, you know, canned uh, peaches or something like that. Um, and so it can cause ptosis, blurred vision, difficulty swallowing, um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. And uh, the reason why we don't give honey to babies is it can cause floppy baby syndrome. Um, and so remember that um, for, for babies, actually, it's, uh, it's not a preformed botulinum toxin, neurotoxin that causes uh, the problem in babies. It's actually the spores. So in adults, the spores don't really do anything. We can actually uh, poop them out and get rid of them uh, because we have uh, our nat natural protective flora in our uh, gut. And so then our botulinum spores actually don't do anything. It doesn't secrete the toxin. However, in babies, they don't have this. And so when they ingest the spores, which can be found in high amounts in honey, it can actually then make its way into the gut of the, of the babies and secrete out its toxin, and that can actually is what causes floppy baby syndrome. So the difference between adults is preformed toxin. In babies, it's actually the spores that then produce the toxin once it is ingested. Okay, remember this guy goes to your synaptobrevin of your uh, neuromuscular junction and cleaves uh, your uh, synaptobrevin, so the vesicles of acetylcholine cannot be released from uh, the presynaptic nerve. Uh, differential diagnosis is Guillain-Barre, but that is ascending paralysis, MG descending, but remember that time frame is a little bit different. All right, so some other toxins like mushroom or fungal toxins, uh, they're usually very short acting, you know, mucinol, uh, muscarine, and psilocybin. Uh, it's usually vomiting, diarrhea, they can be incorporated. Their psilocybin is going to have like neurological aspects where, or psychological problems or aspects. So you're going to see, you know, this is, well, psilocybin is a shrooms, just so you know. Um, and so this is going to be where you're going to be hallucinating and seeing all these vibrant colors and stuff like that. And um, that usually occurs very fast. You also have long acting, which is amanita. So your uh, alpha amanita, which is uh, your death cat mushroom. Uh, usually 48 hours, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and that can actually kill you. So uh, careful with that. Other guys are mycotoxigenic fungi. So mycotoxins and aflatoxins. Remember, aflatoxins is a key thing. You can get it from tree nuts, peanuts, oil seeds. And uh, the problem with these, uh, it goes to the liver. 
And it damages it, causes cirrhosis and liver carcinoma. That is super high yield. All right, next is your ciguatera toxin or your CT toxin. So that's going to mean your Caribbean or tropical toxins. And you're going to get that um, from uh, sea fish, right? So, or um, sea, uh, sea type fish. So that's your barracuda grouper reef fish. And that's going to produce your ST toxin. And this ST toxin uh, actually is uh, th it, it actually occurs very quickly, it causes watery diarrhea, abdominal pain, paresthesia of your um, ex uh, extremities, severe puritis, and then this is the key feature. When you can't settle on a temperature, you have an SD toxin, and that settle on a temperature is specific for ciguatera toxin. So hot, cold temperature reversal. So something that's hot, is supposed to be hot is actually cold to them. Something that's cold is actually hot. And you can't settle on what temperature it is. You can't determine, is it hot or is it cold? And that is your ST toxin, okay? Scomboroids. So scomboroids are a type of fish like tuna, mahi-mahi, and marlin. These actually um, can secrete out a, a non-allergenic um, histamine and histamine causes vasodilation uh, and causes like a burning sensation and a metallic taste in the mouth. So metallic taste in the mouth is, is due to histamine. You also have urticaria because you have or a dilation of vessels and facial flushing because of that. And you also have like pruritus and urticaria because of uh, how histamine works. Also watery diarrhea and nausea, sure. Neurological shellfish poisoning, so brevi toxins. Um, and so this is something you can get on in Florida, Gulf of Mexico. Brevi toxins have certain aspects like paresthesia, mouth numbness, tinkling of the extremities, and GI symptoms are present. This is a key feature here to differentiate our next guy. So GI presence in here and paresthesia and mouth numbness. This guy has a little bit of different. So uh, these are uh, your paralytic shellfish poisoning. So this occurs from dinoflagellates, and these are known as your saxitoxins. There's a reason I have a saxophone player there, and this is going to help you memorize all the aspects of this. This is high yield for your exam, so keep this in mind. So you're going to have tingling and numbness in the mouth. Why? Because you play the saxophone with your mouth. Haha. -ha. You also have ataxia. Well, can't, can't you uh, see his stance, right? He's got this saxophone... Uh, sassy stance, right? So this is your uh, saxophone stance, which is a little bit off. It's not straight up and down. So that's ataxia. It's a little bit ataxic. Then you have muscle paralysis. Um, well, because you're holding up your saxophone, you can have, in severe cases, muscle paralysis. And that's uh, the use of those muscles there. Also, when you're breathing into this saxophone in order to play it, use your breath to play the sax, you can have respiratory paralysis. So that's something that's also involved. And guess what? You don't want to vomit into your saxophone, and so GI symptoms are less common, so there's no vomiting in the saxophone, and he can play away. All right, on to your intestinal nematodes. Um, these guys uh, are never very fun for students, but I have some great ways to remember them. So let's go ahead and get into those. So Ascaris lepicoides is the first guy we're going to get to. No, actually, this one's not very fun, but... Uh, this is a common nematode, and it's really gross, um, and I'm sure you've seen intestines packed full of these guys causing obstruction. Uh, this is something you're going to get in tropi tropical developing countries. Uh, so the infective stage is your fertilized egg, which is uh, these guys over here on the right. Um, and so this fertilized egg is going to infect the body, and we pretty much ingest it through you know, food and water. Um, and then uh, the diagnostic stage is going to be the worm in the stool or the egg in the stool. Um, and pretty much these guys hatch in the small intestines. They invade into the wall, go into the blood, and that blood takes them up to the lungs. Once they make it in the lungs, they break out into the alveoli and migrate uh, up and into the trachea. This is known as your hepatotracheal migration, and this will cause eosinophils to respond. Why? Because eosinophils, remember, respond to parasites, and this is known as Loeffler syndrome. So you have a cough, um, and uh, this is due to uh, pneumonitis within your lungs, you know, inflammation, and we have what type of inflammation? Eosinophils responding, and that is known as Loeffler syndrome. Whenever you see Loefflers, just think of eosinophils. I don't know, I, this guy just loved eosinophils, so anywhere there was Loeffler is involved, just think eosinophils. Okay, development into mature worms. Once they we cough and we swallow them down into the GI tract again, uh, they mature into, uh, into mature worms and uh, they start producing and spitting out eggs and we can find these guys on the stool sample. 
um, is pretty much often asymptomatic other than the Loeffler's cough, uh, pulmonary symptoms, and then that uh, bowel obstruction uh, when we have a lot of these worms. So um, we have these two guys up here. So this is the female. They're a lot larger and the tail is straight. Males, uh, there's a lot smaller and you can see you have a curled tail here. And that's going to be our scarce lump of coides. Uh, these eggs, uh, how we kind of differentiate them from the other guys, we have these little globular things within here. But you can also see that the surface of these actually are kind of rigid, like uh, almost like they have spikes. Like if I were to say this is like a Bowser shell um, or like a, a sharp turtle shell, like a snapping turtle shell, that's what these guys uh, actually look like. It's, uh, it's not the outer surface, actually. It's uh, the inner lining. So we have this... Uh, small circle within here and then we have our outer one and so we have actually the spikes within here you see how that's a little bit rigid on the inside you can see these little dots like this right that is going to be our scarce lemocardies we do have another egg later on one of these guys that actually is actually spiked like this on the outside uh, but that's not going to be in this section we'll get to that in your later um, liver involvement and stuff like that all right, Trichuris trichuria, this is my favorite because I came up with an amazing mnemonic to remember this. So Trichuris trichuria, um, this is Tricky Tricks. And how I remember this is tricks are for kids. So um, uh, tricks for kids, and kids is spelled with a C. Shh, that's totally how you spell tricks, by the way. <laughs> at least for this guy. So tricks are for kids uh, pretty much describes all the features you need to know about this. So it can cause retardation of growth, uh, cause iron deficiency anemia. You, can, uh, you find it across the world, so all over the place. So there's no epidemiology that's specific for this. It is four centimeters long. Oh, this was the best part I discovered for this mnemonic is four centimeters long. And they like to point out size of these guys, okay? Uh, you can cause clubbing of fingers, inflammatory dysentery, so uh, inflammatory bloody diarrhea, and you can also, where do you get it from? You get it from the soil. You diagnose it from the eggs in the stool, and guess what? See this rabbit over here? You know, tricks are for kids. Well, he's eyeballing these tricks. Look at these tricks. And guess what? They're just barrels of fun, just barrels of, uh, of tricky tricks. Okay, so they actually are barrel shaped, and so um, they're, they're barrel shaped eggs, right? You can see this shape of uh, barrels. And at the end, they have these little clear ends, right? They almost look like handles. So if you were to cook up a souffle um, or something like that, a casserole, you have that casserole pan, see the little handle and the handle, and then the barrel shape in the middle, that is your tricky tricks, okay? Um, and those are your trick cereal pieces. Don't forget about those guys. Uh, those, uh, these eggs are super high yield to spot. Ankylostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus. Um, these guys uh, are your hookworms, and uh, they have a hookworm as the name specifically because you can actually see the hooks of their mouth. So they hook onto you, um, and uh, they like to hitch a ride and get into your blood. So what these guys do, uh, hookworms, is you have this filariform larva. This is high yield. This is not an egg as your infective stage. It's actually filariform. It penetrates the skin on your bare feet. So don't walk around in, uh, in, um, in grass, especially if you go to the south like Florida or you know Louisiana or something. Don't walk around in, uh, in grass barefoot because you can get a, a hookworm there. So filariform uh, penetrates the skin, makes its way into the blood, does the hepatotracheal migration causing Loeffler syndrome, so you cough it, swallow it down, and it reaches your small intestines, matures, and spits out eggs, and you can poop those out. And guess what? They go into the environment, reform into your filariform larva, and wait for the next guy uh, to be walking along that grass barefooted. Okay? These guys bite into your skin and bite into your blood vessels and involve blood. So guess what they're going to cause? Iron deficiency anemia. This is your hookworm anemia. They're going to hook into your small intestines, cause slight bleeding over a long amount of time, and that can cause hookworm anemia. The eggs for these guys are pretty much um, egg-shaped, and they have all these just random stuff in here. There's nothing special about them. Sometimes they can have little globulars in here, but nothing that's uh, really special. It helps differentiate these guys. Um, one other egg that looks very similar to this is your Diphylobothrum latum. And how we differentiate them is Diphylobothrum latum has this little end piece you're going to see uh, over here. 
um, where these guys don't have this. So uh, I'm drawing this, and it's gonna that's gonna be what it looks like for Diphylobothrium, uh, but not for these guys. See, these guys do not have that on their eggs. They're just straight up an egg with stuff inside. Okay, there's no little end piece. So we'll get to that in just a minute. So Strongyloides stercoralis. Uh, this is actually high yield on its um, strangities as far as infection. So you infected with the filariform larva and it penetrates the, the skin, does the hepatotracheal migration causing lofflers again. So this is uh, the third guy that does this. Um, and the eggs are deposited in the intestinal mucosa, they hatch, and we have rhabditiform larva. This is your diagnostic stage. Remember our diagnostic was eggs or some other uh, like worm form or mature worms. Um, and those were our diagnostics. This is your rhabditiform larva. Why? Because we poop this guy out in stool and then it forms into the mature worm out in the environment. It doesn't mature in us. It actually is just the rhabditiform. So this is diagnostic, high yield, test question. We had this guy exactly. Um, because it's so weird, it's the only guy that has this really weird thing that we use for diagnostic and it's the larva we actually use to diagnose. We don't diagnose a mature worm or eggs. This is a larva. So that is super high yield to know this guy, okay? This rhabditiform larva can reinfect this person as well. It might not make it out into the poop. Uh, it actually might just reinfect uh, and, and cause this uh, whole system uh, or cycle again. So you can have urticarial rashes because it's a parasite, pulmonary because the lofflers, eosinophil because the lofflers, and obviously we're in the intestinal tract, so diarrhea. So these guys, uh, this is actually what it looks like when it insists into uh, the small intestines. Uh, it looks like these guys, so um, I don't know if that's super ideal to, to spot those guys out, but that's something. Um, how we uh, di differentiate this from some of the other guys, we have a small worm, and it goes to a really sharp point. So that is your stercoralis. Um, uh, for strongyloides, right? He's really strong, but he's really pointed for stercoralis, okay? Enterobius vermicularis. All right, I like this guy. This is your pinworm, super common worldwide. Uh, it's gonna be in children, uh, especially people or uh, older adults that are institutionalized, but they're probably gonna be getting at some child that's itching his butt. So this is your pinworm uh, you've heard about, I'm sure. Uh, you ingest the eggs, eggs hatch in the small intestines, the larvae molt twice, and then they're now uh, adult worms in the large intestines. At nighttime, the female worms move to the perianal and they spit out the eggs out on the lining of the anus. And guess what? The kid goes, what the heck is this worm down here? And he itches his butt. Now it's on his hands and he licks his hands and he reinfects himself. So this is a recurring infection. And so we need to treat this because it's really annoying for the children and it can uh, infect other people like the mother and father and the rest of the family and stuff like that. So you're gonna have perianal uh, um, or perennial pruritus because you're scratching, restless sleep, the child's not gonna be able to sleep properly. And how we diagnose is silo tape or scotch tape. We pretty much take scotch tape, uh, spread their cheeks, put it over uh, their anus, and then when the, the mature maternal worms come out and spit out their eggs, it sticks to the tape. Even the worms can stick to the tape, we can pull them out, and that can be diagnosed. Uh, so what do we look for on these eggs? So these eggs are actually extremely diagnostic and you should be able to point these out. Any doctor should point this out. You're gonna see this in practice in your peds rotation most likely. And if you're gonna be a pediatrician, you are definitely gonna see this. It is so, so common. So guess what? You think you're gonna have a test question on it? Absolutely. So how do we, uh, how do we point these guys out? Well, if you can pinpoint the egg, uh, if you can pinpoint in a picture an egg with one flat side, one flat side, one flat side, one flat side, one flat side. Okay, you see how one side is flatter than the others? This, when you can pinpoint that flat side, one flat side on the egg, then guess what? You can pin worm, <laughs> but it will crash. So uh, pin uh, point that flat side, you can pin worm uh, diagnose, okay? They're very small, uh, this is like uh, in inches up here, you can see how small these guys are. Um, so here, and uh, this is the little girl that's scratching her butt. So uh, the, they might not say that they're itching their butt, actually, they might just say that they have restless sleep, though. Um, this is, might be something you wanna do for further investigation. You ask them if they're itching their butt or something like that, okay? All right, cestodes, we're almost getting to the end here. 
So uh, Diphylobothrium latum, which is also known as your fish tapeworm. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, you're going to get from undercooked freshwater fish. So think of someone that had sushi or carp or perch or salmon. Um, you can get this guy, okay? Uh, pretty much you ingest it. Uh, you ingest the larvae and it attaches to the small intestines and eventually develops into a mature, long tapeworm in the small intestines. Uh, which has lots of proglottids, and within those proglottids, which are the segments of this guy, it releases more eggs. And the eggs mature uh, once we poop them out and they land in water, you know, you're pooping in your toilet, and those, those can mature and form more into your larvae, and then we can eventually get reinfected or infect other people. So symptoms of this, because this worm is very long and it absorbs B12 through its kind of surface skin, it's not skin, but like, you know, it's surface, uh, this can actually cause megaloblastic anemia due to B12 deficiency. That is super high yield, like so high yield because it's a path tie-in, micro gets to test you on a little bit of path, and this is one of them. So just remember Diphylobothrium sends you to the bathroom. <laughs> Um, and so how we can uh, diagnose this is look for those eggs or proglottids in stool. And this is what I was referring to. So you can see our eggs, it's egg shaped and it, we, it's hard to differentiate between our uh, Ankylostoma duodenale and uh, Nicator americanus, those hookworms, except for look, we can see this kind of weird kind of clearing zone at the end, um, even like a line you can see uh, on these guys. Um, and what happens is this opens up and we spit out our worm. If you want to watch this guy, there's actually um, development of this is actually pretty cool. You can watch it on um, on YouTube. They actually have the whole development of this uh, long tapeworm. Uh, it's like this old 19 whatever, you know, 60s video or something like that. It actually goes through the development of these guys. It's actually pretty cool. Um, and you can see this kind of opening up and this guy kind of crawling out of here. It's kind of kind of creepy, but. Um, just look for that little edge uh, in these guys, and that's going to be its little trap door to spit this guy out. And that is uh, one of the diagnostic things we look for um, in order to uh, spot out Diphylobothrum latum as opposed to the hookworms. Okay, Hymenolepsis and Nana. Uh, so I just remember Nana. This is Nana. See your little. Uh, this is uh, Nana's hat, okay? Um, and so dwarf tapeworm, uh, this is very small. It's most prevalent tapeworm, and it's the only one that is human-to-human -human contact spread. Uh, this is places like Asia, Southeast Europe, Central, and South America, and even Africa. Uh, you ingest the embryonated eggs, which is this guy here. So you have a little coconut egg, and then we have another thing like here, and then we have here, that is your coconut. That's going to be Nana's coconuts. Okay, that doesn't sound uh, appropriate. So um, hatching, these are oncospheres. Uh, they run into eggs uh, and form these oncospheres. And it penetrates the, the mucosa in cestation and eventually development of this tapeworm. And we uh, then are going to spit out more eggs and that can further infect other people. So we have other GI tract infections. Uh, C. diff, this is something that's super important uh, in our medical practice. You're going to see this. You're going to see this if you work in a hospital. Um, and we are going to be working in a hospital for two years. So you will see this uh, on clinicals. So this is gram positive. Uh, it is anaerobe. Remember, clostridiums are anaerobes. Uh, normal it's part of the normal microbiota, but it can be pathogenic as well. So this is one of your major nosocomial pathogens. Why? Because we have someone that is taking antibiotics. It has to be following antibiotic use. It's the only way that we get this guy. Um, it has two toxins. Toxins A, which is an enterotoxin, and it causes flu fluid accumulation in the bowel. And then the toxin B, which is a cytotoxin, which decreases protein synthesis by ADP ribosylation, which is something you might have seen in respiratory, which uh, you can find in two pathogens. Stop to think of what are those two pathogens that cause ADP ribosylation. All right, right. Hopefully you thought of... Bordetella pertussis, as well as uh, Cornobacterium diphtheria. Those are the two that cause ADP ribosylation, stopping protein synthesis. This is the third guy that does this. All right, symptoms, uh, you can have mild di diarrhea, colitis, and then pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, we do not do endoscopy. Uh, at this point, we want to determine, is there toxin in the stool? So we have that toxin. Uh, cytotoxin neutralization assay, which is CCNA. Uh, we also can grow it uh, on CCFA auger, which is clostridium, um, cytotoxic something something auger, and taurocholate. 
Um, remember, this is causing fever, leukocytosis, low abdominal pain. This can actually lead not only to pseudomembranous colitis, but actually toxic megacolon. So keep that in mind as well. And this is pretty much the summary of all the different uh, types of uh, infections that you have. I know there's some on here that we didn't cover, so don't worry about it. Just do the ones we did. Uh, but hopefully uh, this is actually helpful for understanding the GI uh, infections, the GI tract, and how, how we kind of approach uh, understanding and diagnosing a patient with one of these types of infections. Medical tutor. You're at SGU and you're thinking about step one. There are so many resources and so many opinions. How do you know which path to take? You've worked so hard and you deserve to match into the specialty of your dreams. Med School Tutors has helped nearly a thousand SGU students get their best scores on their CBSE and USMLEs through highly personalized one-on-one -on -one tutoring and individualized advice. Our SGU students see average step one score increases of over 30 points when working with us. Scores that are their tickets to competitive residency spots around the country. Schedule your free phone consult today to be matched with your tutor. Med School Tutors, get where you want to go. Um, so happy studying. Don't forget to like this video. Um, and uh, as long as you, you're feeling all right, you might not be like this guy having diarrhea in the urinal. So, all right. Thank you very much.